Good morning, this is Mr. Riley, and I will be uh, lecturing on Chapter 3 of CIST 2601. So let me get over to it, and we'll go ahead and start. Okay, access, access controls of Microsoft Windows. So, security control process. Basically, you have to plan this out. You have to plan out your permissions, you know, due to your, you know, positions of your employees, their jobs they do, what access they need, and all that. So, actually creating it is easier than planning it. So, think of what you need. How do you support your security policy? Plan it out. You design it. That's the harder part. Then you, once you implement, once you have the design, you can implement it, and then you evaluate it. Is it doing what you want? Is it supporting your security policy? So, and then if it needs to be tweaked, then you start to process all over again. The principle of least privilege. It's the definition per the Orange Book grants each subject in a system the most restrictive set of privileges or the lowest clearance needed to perform authorized tasks limits the damage that can result from accident, error, or unauthorized use. So what it is, is what, is, what does this employee need to do their job? You give them the privileges just to do their job. Least privilege and uh, LUAs. In Windows, principle of least privilege is implemented in, at the user account level. Microsoft refers to a user account defined as use, using this principle as least privileged user accounts. So that would be like your basic users and stuff like that. Recommended to implement least privilege, create user groups that represent the roles in the organization. You can do that by, you know, your organization chart. A lot of times you do this, whether by your organization chart and like when you're setting up Active Directory, you'd set up that like either geographically or by your organization chart. Sample of default Active Directory security groups. Now, these are created by default. Account operators, users, guests, remote desktop users. Okay, I thought I might have a little explanation with that. Remote desktop users, people who are allowed to remote out, people are allowed to run backups. If you have guests, stuff like that. IIS users, that would be like your web server people. Rights and permissions, each group in Windows has the ability to apply rights and permissions to a set of users. User rights are defined and maintained through group, pol group security policy objects, such as when you create a group. Permissions apply to the specific objects in that group are maintained through each object's security settings. The, like from the previous chapter, we talked about security, S, security identifiers. Same, you know, that's where it's pulled from. Each object has an access control rules, access control list for the object. So if you go to the properties of a folder or file, you will see that it's ACLs. ACLs in Active Directory are made up of list of access control entries. Are you allowed to read? Are you allowed to modify? Are you allowed to delete? Stuff like that. Uh, ACLs that Windows uses are implemented as discretionary access controls. So the list of access control rules and discretionary access control list, DACLs. Each entry in the DACL is an, ex is an access control entry. So let's see if we have a picture of that right here. So we have our security principles. These are our ACEs, the entire thing here. These are our security principles. These are our ACEs. And the whole thing is an ACL. So, I'm not a very good artist, but hope you get the point. <laughs> Access models, users validation, user enters an ID, authentication credentials, username and password most of the time. Windows compares the supplied information from the user to the stored info. If it matches, they're authenticated. Windows records users' security ID, this SID of each group and user privilege, and creates the token. SAT contains user group SIDs, is attached to each process the user runs. So that security access token, that's what SAT stands for here. 
So when they go to run a process, it checks the security access token and makes sure they are authorized to do it and what they're authorized to do. So like what what is part of a security access token? They have the user security ID, the, any groups are part of, what their privileges are, and other access information like time of day and stuff like that if you rest, do restrictions and stuff like that. Windows Server 2012 to 2019 Dynamic Access Control describes a collection of features to describe user and data attributes. Attributes help Windows protect files using policies that provide more access control. The discretionary access control used to identify and classify data. So if you have data and it will look for keywords in there, like say maybe social security numbers or something like that, and then they can classify it. Control file access, it will audit file access to see who's been in there and apply encryption to sensitive documents. So they find a social security number, they may encrypt it, you know, that document. User access control, administer store, administrators group have split security access tokens. One part has full privilege, other part is a limited like a normal user. Now, so if you log in as an administrator, process initially run with the limited. So when you're doing regular stuff, it will run in the limited security access token. If a process requires a privilege that is allowed for the administrators and processes also contains an administrator security access token, Windows prompts users for escalation confirmation. So let's see if it has a picture of it right here. Now, if you are logged on as an administrator, it will ask you if you just want to do it and it won't require a password. But if you're logged on as a regular user, it will ask you for administrative credentials or credentials that will allow you to do that. And this is where you can actually adjust it. If you type in UAC in the search, this will pop up and you can identify this. So you can actually slide this bar. Always notify, I call that the Vista mode. The default setting is right here. And then never notify, that's like you're running wide open. Sharing SIDs and SATs. Uh, security access tokens for each process built from the user SID and group SIDs. Active Directory stores shared information to construct the security access tokens. Domain controller sends security information to the computer where the user logs on. Windows extends the concept of authentication to the computer level when constructing security access tokens. A complete SATs are never shared across the network, only the parts necessary to construct the SAT. So that way it helps keep it more secure and people can't, you know, impersonate you. So the domain controller has the domains user SID, the domains group SID. On the local machine, you have the local group said, and you put them together, and you have the complete. So that no two place, no one place will have the full one until it is put together at the local computer. Manage service accounts. Okay, kind of switching subjects here. Starting with Server 2012, they can be shared across the system. Administrators create these accounts as managed domain accounts that provide automatic password management allows Windows Server 2012 and newer domain controllers to manage passwords automatically at the domain level. Now, what's this all about? If you have a service account, like a service runs a program or supports a program, let's say you add DHCP. Now, if you have multiple servers clustered together, I'll say like a web server cluster, because if, you know, because of traffic and or you have uh, failover cluster where one, if one fails, the other ones will take up the slack. Well, when you set these service accounts on these machines, they have to have the same password. So what happens is it allows us to update one password and it updates them all at the same time. Kerberos, this is basically how you do the key distribution center at the domain controller, and these are the encryption keys to encrypt data communication. So the client requests it, they give them an access ticket, and then it sends the access ticket to the server where they're trying to get the resources from. Windows objects and access control, common securable objects. 
in Windows. You have your NTFS files and folders, pipes and unnamed and unnamed, processes and threads, and you can secure those. You want to you want to make sure your registry keys are secure and each services. You can secure printer and local and remote and basic network shares and job objects. So you can secure all these with passwords and permissions. Securable objects require a discretionary access control list for Windows to control access to the object. Discretionary control is a collection of individual ACEs, ACEs, and can be modified in the object's properties dialog box. So you go to, this is an example of a file, and you go to its properties. And you can actually go to, uh, I'm going to go step back. If you click advanced, it'll take you to the advanced settings for this, and you can actually set up auditing, the effective access of, uh, of a computer or a user on this object. What are they allowed to do to it? SIDs, GUIDs, and CL CLS IDs. Security identifiers in Windows, all users, groups, computers have unique SIDs. Now, if you delete a user but bring them back, they will have a completely different SID and you have to reconstruct their permissions. So a lot of times it, they recommend you disable it for a period of time, but then uh, whether a user or a group. Global unique identifiers distinguishes objects that may originate from different computers, like in a domain or adjacent domain that has trust between you. Used to identify many different types of objects, computers, web browsers, databases, files, and application components. Class identifiers, window, these are the Windows registry, uses GUIDs to identify objects and record attributes. GUIDs are stored in the class identifier. For example, if you want to open my computer, here's a class identifier for it. That's actually a hexadecimal number, 128 bit. You could actually type that in and it should actually trigger it to open my computer. Calculating Microsoft Windows access permissions. Windows resolves objects access requests by the following procedures. Retrieves a user and group security identifiers from the processes security access token. Examines all the access control entries in the object's discretionary access control list for requested permissions. If no Discretionary access controller ACE is identified for the requested access. Windows allows it. If only one ACE exists for the requested access, access is based on whether the ACE is allowed or denied. Deny will always take precedence over allow. If multiple ACEs exist for the same request, access all ACEs must be defined as allowed for Windows to allow the access. If there is one deny in there, then deny will take precedence over all the all the other ones. Returns access approval or denial based on the permissions. So effective permissions were in the advanced security settings for this document or file. If you look at effective access for Michael. And you can actually see they don't have any their effective access. It will calculate what access they have for that. Auditing and tracking Windows access. Auditing is the process of collecting information on which actions were taken and stores the information for later analysis. First step, you have to turn it on. It's not turned on by default. It tells Windows to record the event that will be defined for later analysis. So you have to tell it what to audit. Windows stores the audit events notes in the event logs and you'll be doing a lab in that. So if you go to the local security policy, it will be under local policies, audit policy, right? And audit object access. So it will tell you when things, when cert, when objects are audited and you want to check for failure or success. Log on events. Was there any failures? Now, depending on what you're looking for, success tells you when, you know, John Smith logged on. 
success or failure for audit object access tells one, you know, an employee successfully opens an object or fails to open an object. Usually, depends on what you're looking for. The failure will show that maybe a brute force attack's happening and you see a bunch of log entries. With the success, you're checking to see when people have logged on and when they've accessed and stuff like that. So, and you can actually do both. So, expression based security audit policy in Windows Server 2012 and newer. Discretionary access control in Windows Server enables administrators to create targeted audit policies using expressions based on the user, computer, and resource claims. An example would be audit everyone without a high security clearance and who attempts to access highly sensitive documents or someone who's not a lawyer that tries to check some of the law cases. And access control management tools, some of the tools would be um, CACLS, execute, ICALS, execute. Now this is the original, it was replaced with ICACLs and RoboCopy. And you'll be doing a lab in that. Okay, best practices for Microsoft Windows Access Control. And this is like a mnemonic, a gulp. You take accounts, user accounts, computer accounts, and put them into global groups. So you put this into here. Then you assign access controls. I mean, I'm sorry, you assign permissions to local groups. And I don't know what this is. This is not right. Access controls? No. Then you put global groups into local groups. So, and the U is supposed to be universal groups. Here, I'm going to... Okay, with this you would put, uh, you'd set up your accounts, whether they're in global or universal groups, and like, you know, John Smith, Susan Jones, John Doe, Tyrell, whatever, you know, you put inside these groups. Univer global groups are within the domain, universal groups are through multiple domains. And then you would put these two groups into the local groups, so. Okay. So you you take the accounts of the users' computers, put them in global or universal groups, put global and universal groups into local groups, and then you assign permission to the local groups. Okay. That finishes up chapter three. Thank you.